All right. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. We are very much delighted and excited to have you in the webinar today. So it's 11, 11 a.m. over here in Abuja, and um, we'll be starting right away. But um, in the meantime, um, it is important that I let you you know, give some overview of what we're going to be talking about. So currently, Africa is being ravaged by several challenges that ranges from education, poverty, inequality, unemployment, and what have you. But you really understand that the education challenge serves as, um, stands at the center of all these challenges, given the fact that it has a spillover effect on all other challenges. And it has never been more important than now to really understand how inclusive education can be achieved in Africa. And today we'll be looking at one, one segment of achieving this inclusive education, which is the adoption and use of education technology. And today our emphasis would not just be on deciphering um, education technology in Africa, but really understanding the progress so far, the problems and pathway to inclusive education. My name is Gwede Namani. I am a research and communications assistant at the Center for the Study of the Economies of Africa. So just before we dive in into the event proper, it would be nice to hear from you. Could you please use the chat to let, let us know where you are joining us from, what city you are joining us from, and what time it is over there. So I see that a good number of participants have already joined in. Please use the chat box to let us know what city are you joining us from and um, what time is it over there? Let's um, have it in the chat, yes. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, I see you. Thank you for joining me, thank you for joining me. I see your chats. Okay. All right. So straight up, um, you will be delighted to know that this webinar is organized by the Center for the Study of the Economies of Africa in strong collaboration with Southern Voice and Grady Group for the Dev Group for Analysis of Development. So C Center for the Study of the Economies of Africa, CC, is a research think tank domiciled in Abuja. Nigeria, and our emphasis is on using evidence-based and data-driven research to inform policy, not just in Nigeria, but um, into Africa by extension. And then um, also there is Southern Voice. Southern Voice is a group of think tanks in the Global South that aims to achieve and implement um, issues, um, implement you know, initiatives that would really help in solving um, sustainable development goals challenges in the global south. You would agree with me that solving SDGs has really been um, a challenge in the global south and Southern Voice is really on, on this particular issue. And then there is Grade, the group for the analysis of development. Grade is um, a research think tank as well that is domiciled in Latin America. And their goal really is to use um, evidence-based research and applied research to ensure that um, policy, public policy issues, public policy issues um, are discussed and conversed on in, the, in Latin America. All right, so I see some of the chats. The chat box is there for me. Oh, sorry about that. So I would quickly enable the chat box for every, for some persons. I see that. All right, so while um, I'm on that, um, I would be delighted, it would be my delight to invite um, one representative from, from Southern Voice, Daniela Garcia. Daniela is the research, is a research and project associate at Southern Voice, and she will be giving, in, giving the opening remarks. So over to you, Daniela. Thank you, Great, very much. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes? Yes. Good. Okay, well, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you're based today. Uh, my name is Daniela Garcia, as great uh, kindly introduced me. I am project and research associate at Southern Voice. Uh, well, I would like to first thank DG and great and the whole team at CCA for organizing this event, both on behalf of Southern Voice and also our partner, the Group for Analysis of Development in Peru, Grade. They unfortunately aren't able to join us today, but they are following up on the discussion. Um, 
I would just like to say that we have been working together with Cecilia and Grade for over a year now, trying to understand better the ethnic landscape in Sub-Saharan Africa specifically. We wanted to understand the state of ethnic use, design, and governance in the region. The purpose of this exercise was uh, to understand what could be the next steps for EdTech to truly support education and learning in countries of the Global South, and especially in low and middle income countries. So we set out to identify research gaps that we may need to study better in order to advance the implementation of EdTech, uh, and also policy interventions, both successful and not so su successful, try to get some examples on what can we do, what, uh, what are good practices that can really prevent us from further increasing inequalities and vulnerabilities when in the use of edtech and rather help us strengthen education uh, and learning uh, in countries of the global south i would like to also add that uh, besides um, the report that cci is uh, sharing with us today we actually explored the main factors using the uh, shaping the use design and governance of edtech in 31 countries across the global south so we have a report from sub-saharan africa but we also did the same for latin america and asia and with this, we produce a global report in collaboration with the different centers. So I will be sharing the links to these reports uh, if anyone is interested in the chat after I finish my intervention. And uh, there's also a project synthesis note for all those that are interested. And that said, well, thanks again, DJ. Thanks again, great. And welcome everybody to this event. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you very much, Daniela. Thank you so much for your support. A very big thanks to the Southern Voice team for their support and um, the implementation of the project as well. All right. Thank you, everyone. If you are just joining us, um, we had just had the opening remarks by Daniela Garcia, the Research and Projects Associate at Southern Voice, which also happens to be an implementing partner of the project. So it is my very delight to really mention that we have our panelists um, on the call already, Dr. Rislan, Siku, and Dr. Jara. Thank you so much for joining us. So straight up, we'll be um, the next thing on the agenda is to have the presentation and report presentation by Dr. Adedeji Adeniran. Dr. Adedeji is the director of research at the Center for the Study of the Economies of Africa, and also happens to be the lead researcher of the project. Thank you very much, Dr. Adedeji. It's over to you. Thanks, great. Um, so let me just share my, hope you can see my screen now. Okay, um, I believe we can see my screen. Okay, so thanks everyone for joining us this morning. Um, this has been an exercise we embarked over the last um, one and a half years. Um, and like Daniel has said uh, uh, in, in his conversation, this is actually a global studies uh, that covers Latin America, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, Asia region. And this work is specifically uh, presenting some of the findings from the um, what we uh, the work we led on the um, uh, uh, Sub-Saharan African space. Um, the important thing to to note uh, in terms of um, uh, this study is the fact that uh, uh, our conceptualization of this work is it, it, it's not to look at uh, 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 the, the private sector in terms of uh, the um, uh, tech ecosystem per se, but to really, really ask the background in, in, in the part of our mind is the education problem in Africa. And so the, the, the first thing is to look at the education landscape in, in the continent, looking at what are the key uh, challenge um, on the continent. And the two uh, problem that stand out has, uh, has to do with the problem of one, uh, getting children to school in terms of whether access or um, those that uh, left school transition back to school. Or the other part of the problem is relates to uh, those in school. For example, the learning uh, uh, poverty, uh, I mean, kids not learning in school kids not completing schools, school administration problem, and also learning inequality that exists uh, in the school system. So all of that problem are the kind of background in, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, the, the study in terms of what is the problem that the patient sector is facing. To make this more concrete, I mean, these are data from, um, from UNICEF uh, and World Bank, and it's really capture and give a, a kind of picture into uh, problems in different areas and on the continent. So 
um, uh, the, the first figure looks at the proper uh, teacher ratio in sub-Saharan African countries. And the idea is actually to show you um, uh, 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 the infrastructure in terms of uh, 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 how, how, how we are dealing with within the school system. The benchmark is around kind of five, uh, but we see that in many schools, uh, we have um, pupil ratio ratio actually higher than that benchmark level. And over time, things has improved, but very marginally as that improvement be. But when we look at what is even going on within the school system, like as I mentioned, um, looking at school deprivation measure and learning deprivation measure. Uh, the two are what is combined to actually derive what is called learning poverty rate. And again, we look at the whole of Sub-Saharan African country, we see that um, the learning poverty is quite high, uh, as high as 83.9% um, in East Africa, and the country that we could even say is doing better, I mean, the region that is doing better, Central Africa, is still around 72.7%. Uh, that shows you that the share of um, age 10 kids that are not learning at the age appropriate level. And if we look at, if we look at this problem, where is it coming from? It's actually uh, less of school deprivation. Uh, it's more of uh, learning deprivation. I mean, schooling and access to school play a role. However, even among the majority that are in school, uh, they are not learning. So how do we improve this? And that's actually the question. Can EdTech uh, change the trajectory in, uh, in, in, in African education landscape? Uh, our study we looked into, um, we, we defined uh, uh, EdTech as hardware, um, whether radios, television, phones, smartphones, tablets, or so, and the software that enable them to work. Uh, including infrastructure like internet, local connect, electricity, and all of that that's really deployed for the purpose of improving school system. And when we track all of this, some of the uh, technology that has made it to uh, African um, uh, uh, school system or homes uh, are some of these. So we, we we have two types we can look into. One is the general, general technology that, I mean, that could be used by uh, all group of people like interactive board, radio, televisions, but also personalized one that is actually targeting uh, each uh, uh, learner or teacher, uh, including laptops, smartphone, uh, virtual reality, and tablets. All in all of this, you uh, I highlighted two technology. One is radio, and uh, one is um, and smartphone. Why this is highlighted is the fact that when we look at the data in terms of access, these are the two that are actually very, very accessible uh, by most households in Africa. And so that might be one entry point for uh, a technology into the education system. We'll talk more about this uh, in, in the course of the work. So here, uh, it's the first thing we look at is the ed tech readiness of African countries. And we looked at uh, uh, um, 10 African countries specifically um, in, in, in this uh, analysis. So we look at um, four kinds of criteria, looking at the percentage of households that own a computer, a percentage of individuals that own mobile phone, percentage of individuals that have internet connectivity, and percentage of individuals that have access to electricity. Uh, the idea we are trying to actually put here is to actually capture or analyze to some extent the demand for ed tech on the continent. And we could not actually estimate what how much people are using ed tech or technology per se, but we could actually ask how many people have the technology for them to be able to be a user of ed tech technology. And all of this shows you uh, a, 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 some elements of um, where the readiness is. Where the, uh, I mean, like I pointed out earlier, um, in terms of access to computer, which is what most of this um, huge ed tech technology tends to be uh, built for, the access to that is low. But when we talk about access to mobile phone, uh, that's quite high on the continent already. In terms of access to internet, that is increasing, uh, uh, but it's it's one of the lowest area. In terms of access to electricity, that's also better. But that this this picture also still uh, do not reflect. If you look at the report. Uh, we, we, we highlighted some very uh, uh, heterogeneity in, 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 in this assets. For example, rural urban depravity, whereby uh, urban, rural area tends to suffer 
among households, whereby also uh, a, a, a lot of households tend to suffer. Even in terms of uh, uh, access across country, for example, francophone countries might have less access to resources in the air tech space compared to anglophone countries, give, given the language uh, uh, of, of many of the, where the technology is emerging from. So those are the kind of uh, dimensions that uh, we highlighted in the report as part of air tech uh, readiness and how uh, various factors that actually shape uh, the demand for air tech in, in, on the continent. So in terms of the demand factors, we highlighted uh, some enablers and barriers. One is the community. I mean, imagine community, uh, Technology that has a community of users tends to actually uh, uh, grow, and that speaks to um, some of the characteristics of uh, digital technology in terms of the fact that um, um, when uh, 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 there is this network effect in, in, in it, and we see that network effect not just in in, in, in the social media uh, uh, technology that this is well documented, but even in terms of head tech, the network effect is 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 is, is a major uh, uh, effect. Uh, but also uh, the enablers include level of income, but also budget, how, how accessible it is for household, but also digital skills. This especially uh, speak to digital skills among teachers. And um, um, part of when we are doing this study, we, we actually also uh, look at the impact of uh, COVID-19. And one of the facts that resonates in, in our work is the fact that um, uh, school system that has uh, teachers with access to digital skills were able to be more resilient and cope with the shocks. Mm -hmm. On factors like uh, uh, parental education, parental income, and access to this technology at home also is, is, is a major factor. So also is the timing in terms of how the technology is designed, but more importantly, privacy and security of the technology. Those are factors we highlighted as enablers for uh, on the demand side, but also there are kind of barriers. Um, uh, infrastructure is one of the major barriers, like including electricity and internet, location, especially people in uh, vulnerable areas, um, conflict zones, rural areas, uh, those are major issues, but also privacy concerns, it's, it's a major issue and administrative barriers uh, uh, continue to be a major factor. I will speak more on the uh, administrative barriers when I, I, I speak about some of our findings from the political uh, economic uh, uh, findings of this work. Um, in terms of um, where, I mean, what are we using ed tech for? And a, a little bit on, on, on the supply, what, what are the kind of things we are seeing ed tech being deployed to? I mean, two things to uh, look at in this table is the fact that the, there is concentration of um, ed tech in terms of uh, Deployment and I mean the uh, uh, supply of it um, uh, in southern and western Africa. Um, again, um, some countries actually have driven this. Uh, so South Africa and uh, Nigeria tends to play a, a key major role. In East Africa, Kenya continue to play play a dominant role. But when you see Central Africa, very little uh, supply in that uh, at that end. Um, and this supply is actually what's um, being supplied by the private sector. So this has to do no and, uh, and other government initiatives. Where are these um, things being deployed into? Critical area learning, provision, uh, tracking learning. So in a way, we eventually see more yeah, a tech deployment into yeah, solving in school problem around learning, which uh, uh, also tend to target personalized kind of learning as, as a core component of it. Um, what are the kind of uh, uh, enablers on this side, on the supply side? One is digital policy, uh, uh, as, uh, which exists uh, from the government. So that existence of digital policy is a factor we see that encourages all that tends to see whether government is more actively involved in a tech space or not. Also, digital infra uh, basic infrastructure. I mean, like uh, I've mentioned, it's also a, a, a key driver. Countries that has already has some digital development tends to also have more uh, uh, involvement or more kind of uh, uptake and adoption of ed tech technology in 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 the countries that we looked into. Uh, funding it's also a major uh, uh, component of adoption uh, or supply uh, uh, drivers in 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 African countries. Um, but more importantly is the, how, how the technology also align with education and curriculum integration. 
Um, one fact is, um, I, I mean, even if you, if you develop a technology, that doesn't make it really uh, work everywhere. Even, um, learn, learn, I mean, learning model could be similar, but curriculum and some kind of alignment needs to be achieved. And in uh, the more that uh, the technology could embrace or speak to those kind of uh, uh, policy barriers, the more uh, that, that uh, enable and supports uh, adoption. But kind of barriers include cost and market size, um, most African countries, like I said, uh, there's, there tends to be dominant in a few countries. Most countries actually has uh, 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 low uh, uh, market size in terms of technological adoption. Prioritization of privileged population continue to be um, one clear pattern and that creates um, some digital divide uh, in, in, in this. Complexity of implementation is also a factor whereby we've seen some uh, uh, part of the uh, um, education system, I've adopted uh, ed tech, but also the, um, over time, uh, they moved over to uh, the traditional way of doing things due to complexity of in implementation in, in many instances. Um, so those are kind of the problem uh, uh, on the supply side. So all of these factors is actually what we really uh, put into this framework. I've been mean, looking at uh, uh, some of uh, the conversation uh, we have, I mean, just to summarize uh, what are the barriers and what are the enablers on the supply side and on the demand side um, in, 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 as part of uh, our findings in these studies. Um, a little uh, story around uh, COVID-19 and uh, edtech adoption. I think um, we, we all recall how COVID-19 affected the education system and one of the poor or one of the mm -hmm. uh, the good things that happens as a result of the COVID-19 is there's a lot of interest in uh, digital education, distance learning. And um, at that end, I mean, we see a lot of um, uh, interventions, um, including the use of radio, the use of television, the use of all sorts of technology to, uh, 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 to address learning uh, gaps that emerge out of COVID-19. One of the key findings is that most of what actually countries were able to deploy effectively uh, happens to be radio and television, even uh, not the tablet, not the smartphone. Uh, the, the level of adoption of that is actually quite low. For example, in Nigeria, um, data shows that um, only less than uh, 2% of the school were able to deploy apps uh, app or, or mobile apps or using uh, anything other than um, uh, radio, television, and face-to-face -face interaction as part of uh, what the uh, coping strategy for COVID-19. So um, one important thing is that COVID-19 highlighted the importance of digital literacy and why edtech could be important. And one of the response to that is we see increasingly uh, 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 policies uh, coming up and also interest uh, in, in that. But sustaining that interest has always been a problem as uh, I showed in this slide. Um, so you, you look at funding that uh, comes into the um, African continent um, due to uh, COVID-19. I mean, before COVID-19, 2020, we could see um, a, a, a modest investment coming in, but 2021 is the highest year in terms of investment for ethics. But in 2022, we see a slowdown, which, but not back to where, where it ought to be. Uh, the data for 2023 actually is out and it shows a little also dipped, but not also back to uh, pre-2022. So one, uh, uh, I mean, two points to highlight there is one, um, COVID-19 led to some investment in, 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 in ed tech, but some of those investments were not sustained post-COVID-19. So some of the gains have not been relatively sustainable. And that issue of sustainability also speak um, to many issues that we find in terms of government interest even in, 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 in ed tech also. I mean, some of the um, emerging interest that uh, we saw during COVID-19 were not sustained. So part of the challenge during COVID-19 includes limited time for government to plan structural issues such as digital uh, and all this urban divide in government ability to actually uh, address uh, those structural issues were very problematic. And in uh, training for uh, uh, educators were also a challenge in, in, in that. The, the, the point here is, uh, um, the, 
the thing that I want to highlight here is the fact that the, to build a, a resilient system, technology is very important as we've seen, but part of this problem needs to be addressed. Planning ahead of time, um, we need to address structural problems. Um, we need to actually put teachers at the center of our innovation around technology. Uh, what are the, some of the um, policies um, across our selected countries? Uh, um, so this table actually just summarize some of the policies um, that have emerged um, uh, around ICT, both before and also some that have been introduced in, in the emergence of uh, uh, um, uh, COVID-19. I, I think the point to mention is when you look at all, the, all this policy, it has one, um, one keyword, ICT, ICT. And I want to really, really uh, see one fact is that um, most of the policy environments still think about air tech as an ICT policy. An ICT policy tends to actually really look at it from digital literacy, digital skills, but in a way embedding technology uh, as part of the uh, education is still far from the goals in terms of the policy. So we still need to really see more kind of encompassing um, uh, ed tech policies such that um, we see technology as uh, 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 we see technology uh, coming into school system such that it's really think around the problem of the system rather than really the skills paths uh, complement that we, we we tend to really uh, associate technology with. In terms of um, interests uh, in, in 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 stakeholder interest in ed tech in terms of support over the years. Uh, so we 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 look and divided this interest in three areas. Whether it is low, if uh, in terms of your commitment, either um, finance or uh, other support, but also in terms of um, if it, uh, or high if there's high level of investment, and two agents that actually has strong kind of prioritization of ed tech uh, has been the donor uh, in terms of uh, donor and the private player ed tech community. Uh, governments and um, um, interest has been low, and also uh, em embracing and incorporating uh, um, ed tech into teacher training has also been very weak. Um, one argument is that uh, donor community, I mean, looking at donor investment, is still less than 10% of what we actually see in terms of budget uh, funding in Africa. So, um, ed tech is one way that uh, donor can see. Um, uh, scaling their investment in that sector, but how to bring government uh, uh, in terms of funding and prioritization of this has also been an issue um, in, in that area. Generally, usage of ed tech and in terms of adoption among students is still low. Uh, uh, per parental support is, uh, we, we rate that as medium because most of the entry point actually for ed tech has been through uh, tools that are done, whether radio, whether television, or uh, 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 parents through their uh, telephone. Those have been the major entry points. Uh, in terms of teacher inclusion, this has been weak. And uh, in, in terms of training them for ed tech, this is weak. And um, these are things we need to address going forward. So final, uh, um, in terms of what are the uh, key political challenges, uh, political economy issues that we see as key barriers. Number one is funding. Um, 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 second one is the issue of governance structure and transition of political powers. What we see is that uh, most times, um, even when there is political will, transition in government tends to actually weaken sustenance of um, uh, uh, ed tech policy. We see this in many countries and many cases of government uh, a program that we review, whereby changing government has actually dampened uh, support for those ed tech policies. Um, procurement issue is a major problem. Um, uh, in, in, in two cases that we review, I think in Kenya and South Africa, it took about two years actually from government commitment and funding of, 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 of ed tech, and it's actually manifesting in the school. So that two years already uh, bring on board these political changes that are also affect momentum around implementation of ethic policy. So if we are going to get ethic uh, policy right, the procurement issues that tend to incapacitate uh, uh, swift deployment of technology, it's something to also think about. But more importantly, prioritization and political uh, policy clarity, it's critical if we are going to get ethic right into the school system. Um, 
next step uh, in terms of way forward, um, we think uh, low, adopt, uh, low level of tech, tech adoption, um, especially is centered around uh, the issue of we unable to actually address the issue of digital divide and inequality within the system. And these are structural issues that we need to address holistically. Um, education have a lot of role to play, but more importantly, we also have a uh, od, 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 other tools, uh, social policies that we need to actually bring on board. But more importantly, policy uh, uh, should be driven by interest in education quality rather than politics. Um, idea, the, the, the key idea here is that the, to actually center high tech intervention and innovation around uh, the school system and education problem, um, and uh, especially around teachers. More importantly, we need to provide supportive infrastructure such as electricity, uh, because high tech tools, it's, uh, it, it relies so much on this. One of the infrastructure that's really critical, that is really critical and we actually also highlighted in the report is insecurity, whereby we, uh, we document cases of schools whereby we have technology there, but it's not being used because um, it's not very secure to use. And so most times it's actually just safe in a very secure place within the community. So there are many challenges to adoption of ed tech in, 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 the, in Africa as the report has clearly identified. And um, the way forward is to actually think comprehensively, not just in terms of the technology, but thinking about a wider uh, approach to ensuring that we address the education problem in, this, uh, in the community and look for the appropriate role for technology. Uh, what, where, which, which, which path, uh, which problem is um, technology going to solve as part of the uh, society problem around uh, learning poverty and access to education. So thank you so much uh, uh, for being part of this conversation. Thank you so much. Over to you, uh, great, thanks. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Deji, for that insightful um, and invaluable presentation. I mean, I think there is a lot of information to really take note of. I mean, isn't it amazing that um, the government that is supposed to be at the forefront of edtech intervention is having um, low in, in invest, investments and intentions about this? And I think one of the striking thing about um, your presentation was um, the, the fact that over the years, right, we've ha we had a rising investment in the ed tech se education and technology sector only to witness a sharp decline after 2021. And um, I'm afraid that that decline might actually continue in, in the next couple of years. And then there is this emphasis on ICT policy, like you mentioned, you know, the fact that the emphasis on developing a policy document rather than actually investing and committing time to um, education technology. Once again, thank you very much. And um, if you're just joining us, I think I did mention that we, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the, the chat box to send in your questions. And I see a couple of questions already. We'll be willing to take them um, after the panel session. All right, so um, straight up, we're moving over to the panel session and I'm glad that we have um, Siku already on the call. Siku, thank you so much um, for for joining us, I'm very much delighted to have you. I think Dr. Rislan and Dr. Pedro are yet to join the panel. We're looking forward to having them join in shortly. So, in case you don't you, you don't know who Siku is, I watched a video of, of Siku's um, conversation on on Twitter, and I was thrilled. And uh, since then, I've been looking forward to this day. And Siku is an innovation manager at Brink, and also doubles as the lead as the head and lead of my uh, EdTech Hub in in um, the head and lead of Etikov in Kenya, right? And she has over 10 years of experience working with social enterprises in East Africa. And you would see that we're talking about Africa generally, right? Well, it'd be nice to hear from Siku's experience, learn from her wealth of experience. And I should also mention that she has an MSc in public policy and in public and urban policy from the University of Glasgow, United Kingdom, and is also an Acumen East Africa fellow. Thank you so much for joining us, Siku.
All right. All right. So I'll be starting off with um, a couple of questions and need to really get your purview on Dr. Deji's presentation. Um, I you could see from the presentation that one of the one of the key issues really mentioned was on edtech adoption, right, and innovation. Um, it would be nice to really get your purview on what it has been like. What has it been like over there in, in Kenya, based on your experience and working with edtech hub? And I should really give a, a lot of credits to edtech hub because they played a very big role in the report preparation. I mean, their documents are very very insightful and invaluable to the team. So please let us know what has it been like. What has edtech adoption been like in Kenya, and how can you, you know, connect that with the findings from um, the reports as presented by Dr. Deji? Thank you, great, and it's um, really, really an honor to be part of this conversation. I think it's a conversation we need to have more frequently, and I also love the diversity that I see in this webinar. It's interesting. I, I was looking at the statistics as the presentation was going on, and I had read the report and. It's amazing to see the similarity in in the in I guess some successes, but also challenges across all of the regions. So what we're facing in the east is also what is being faced in the south, in Central Africa, and um, in West Africa as well. Kenya has, has started the journey of deliberately integrating technology for teaching and learning. I would say in 2013 through our digital literacy program, and. There have been challenges. Um, the government itself acknowledges that there were challenges in the design. Um, doctor mentioned in his presentation that our procurement processes um, took a really long time, and so there was a delay. There were also challenges around leadership because you're bringing together multiple uh, ministries to collaborate around this one program. But there was a pivot around 2015 that kind of... Um, address some of those issues. And I think we've seen for the most part, I would say with confidence, because um, of course I, in my role at EdTech Hub, what we do is we generate evidence. And so I have been around the schools. We do have, um, I would say above average connectivity. Our infrastructure is, I would say not bad. Um, our learners have the tablets, but we are still not seeing edtech adoption um, leading to improvement in learning outcomes. And so you have to now take a seat and ask why. I think a lot of the challenges come to come with the fact that our teachers are not at the center of this intervention. I think we rushed to equip the learners without quite understanding that the teacher is a core component of this process. And so now we're in the we're in the middle of reverting back and relooking at how we are training our teachers because you can say that you've trained I think we've trained over 75,000 teachers but what did that training look like are you equipping these teachers to be able to not just be the people that hand over the tools to the learners but actually use technology for teaching and learning I think there's a gap there that we are addressing now um, policy I think that that was also mentioned in your report um, our policies are not very clear. We are still very much pegged on, on using the term ICT, which gives a completely different connotation. But then also, I think a challenge that government needs to address is the fact that when you're dealing with technology, you can't use the traditional way of policy making. How do we make policies more agile? By the time you deliberate for two years to pass a policy around edtech, what you were discussing two years ago has long been taken over. And let's not even talk about the age of AI. So we need to be able to, as governments, be more adaptive, be more agile in the way we are creating these policies. More importantly, how are we monitoring? How long is it taking us to realize that after we implement, there's an issue? Are we doing a review every year? Because that's too long. By the time you go back a year later, we've missed quite a lot of opportunity. And I think the third thing I would want to highlight is around equity. Granted, it's easier to do infrastructure and connectivity in urban areas. And so there are disparities. When you look at Kenya, for instance, I think it's safe to say that we have one of the most progressive education systems until you start looking at the layers. So at a national level, our figures don't look too bad. But when you go now into the subnational levels, you begin to see disparities. What's happening in the urban areas is not what's happening in the rural areas. What's happening with our marginalized areas? How are our girls learning? Um, you know, things like that. And so this is even before you talk about technology. This is now just the education system. So when you integrate technology in a circumstance like that, you need to be really careful that the technology is not further dividing our learners, 
but you need to find a way. You can't implement technology in the same way in an urban area that you would in a rural area. You would be giving undue advantage to those in the urban areas than you are in the marginalized areas. So how do we personalize how we, and again, this goes back to agility in policy. You can't have a blanket policy. You need to figure out how to cater for the groups that don't fall within the blanket of what you would consider your normal. So maybe those are some of my reflections. I don't know if I've answered oh. your question at all, but yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think that was really, really um, in-depth, right, and profound. I think I came across the digital literacy program while they're doing the research. And yeah, I got to really learn a lot about the program, the one laptop per child and um, a couple of them. I mean, I'll get back to you. But um, we have Dr. Pedro on the call. And um, Dr. Pedro, um, I think it would be nice to... Um, really here for me, but just in case you don't know Dr. Pedro, he's um, actually the chief statistician at UNICEF, and we are very much delighted to have him. Um, Dr. Pedro has actually worked on a lot of edtech um, um, initiatives, and um, specifically he worked at the World Bank where he was the lead economist and edtech fellow, and um, education statistic coordinator also for the education global practice. Hi, Dr. Pedro, thank you so much for joining us. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you very much for having me, and and good morning, good uh, afternoon, good evening to yeah. colleagues, depending where you are. Um, and for me, it's a little bit early here, so it's kind of like yes. six a.m. in the morning. So I apologize <laughs> for the right, connection. Uh, but you know, it's a pleasure to be here, and and thank you uh, very much for the, the invitation. I think that oh, no, that's a, a so. But let me know if you want me to come in yes, with yes. my comments right, right now, so, or yeah, yeah. So um um, I don't know if you you were here while the digital presented, but I mean, I really wanted to, as the chief statistician, it would really be nice to you know get your purview on the role of data and you know evidence based research in informing initiatives that would really help um in addressing education challenges in Africa. What role do you really think that data and evidence based research play generally? Sure. No, I think it's huge. Look, uh, I have a huge respect and, and appreciation for for colleagues working in education in Africa, right? I think the the challenges of today and the future are just enormous. If you look at the demographics, right, Africa, Africa is the future of the planet, right? Uh, this is the place, the only place where population is growing. This is where half of the youth will be, right? And and the reality is that everybody entering the labor force by 2050 has already been born, right? So we have to, we have a huge challenge. The world has a huge challenge and, and, and Africa has a huge challenge, right? And of course, Africa, it's, it's, there are many countries, many languages, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an extremely complex uh, environment, right? If we think of the challenge of my country, Brazil, Right, and, you know the number that I, I always look at is back in 20, 20, uh, 2002, 2002, Brazil, Bangladesh, and Nigeria had to educate forty five million kids. Right, this is this was the size of the age cohort from zero to fourteen, basically that they had to push through the educational system. The three countries had forty five million kids to educate. Right, twenty years later. In 2022, Brazil and Bangladesh are down from 45 to 40 million kids. Nigeria has gone from 45 to 90 million kids, right? Uh, no high-income country in the world has ever had to educate 90 million kids, right? The If you look at France, Germany, England, uh, the United States, right? I mean, the European ones, they're like, having had to educate about 10 to 14, 15 million kids, right? The U.S. has had to educate 50 million kids. And they have the same number for the last 60 years, right? It's the flat. It's flat, right? Completely flat. It hasn't changed because of migration, right? Because of migration, all of these countries. Now, uh, if we look at China and India, which are not a very good comparison for, for Africa, because again, Africa is not a single country, right? Uh, those are two countries, right? Uh, at their peak, at their peak, uh, China had to educate about uh, 
uh, 300 million kids, right, uh, at its peak. Um, and the peak in China was in 1977. Since 1977, the number of kids that China has had to educate has gone down 150 million. So if you look at the period in which China has been growing and the quality of human capital has been improving, it has happened in the period in which demographic has been favorable to this, right? They have had, let's say, an educational system that was scaled for 300 and, 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 and something million kids, and today they have 150 million less, right? Now, today, Africa has, and only sub-Saharan Africa, right, has today half, half a billion kids to educate today, right? Um, India, same thing, 300 and, and uh, 360 million kids peaked in 2008. Since 2008, the numbers have been going down, right? So I think that the 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 challenge and the, the reality and the context that we face in Africa is radically different from anywhere else in the world in recorded history. And I think we need to start this conversation by recognizing that, right? And this is not to kind of throw a Hail Mary and say, oh my God, what are we going to No, no, it's quite the opposite, right? I mean, there's a lot that we can do, right? And I'm very optimistic. And I believe that, you know, the solutions are in Africa because me as a Brazilian, I cannot even begin to understand, <laughs> right? The, the, the languages issue, right? I never had to grow up in an environment that my, you know, I naturally learn five languages, right? And, and I'm always amazed talking to African colleagues, right? How many languages you speak? Because I have this, my parent, my mother, my village, my school, my, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys are, you guys know this environment, right? This is something that you're familiar with. And, and I think uh, you need to learn. We, you need to teach us how to help you on 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 how to make uh make the best of out of this resource but i definitely think that we have to think outside the box which is not teachers have to be at the center right there's no experience in the world in which people have been able to learn by themselves right and right so so teachers are at the center of this process but i also think that um and of course evidence has to be at the center as Siko mentioned, right? I mean, it's great to have all these outside the box ideas, bringing a technology, right? But if that's not having an impact on learning, you know, we're not going to be moving the needle, right? So we need to keep an eye on the ball and we need to keep clarity on the objective, which is learning. Of course, we need to agree on what, what, what is the learning that we're talking about, right? Because, I mean, learning means a lot of different things for different people, right? I do think that one element that is uh, of interest for us to look at is the 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 idea of the minimum proficiency levels and the global proficiency framework that have come about in the context of the of the SDGs. Not because the SDGs are some magical bullet and magical standard, no, but because it is useful to have some underlying common understanding of where we want to get right and we can and, and maybe this is not perfect but we can build on that right because again i think that part of the the the, the critical element that i see going forward and that comes to the point of the use of data as well is that we need to have a way to learn from each other right um because the the demographic pressures and the demographic elements and the resource elements that I've mentioned, right? Uh, we need scale. And we need, uh, and, and if each country or each community is defining learning in a different way, it's just going to take much longer yeah. for us to, to build that scale, right? So I think technology is great for scalable solutions, but if if we are trying to all do our own little thing, it's going to be much harder. And and the numbers are just astonishing, as I mentioned, right? Uh, and one last point that I, I and I can move on, but is, is that I think it is important to, to look at the health experience, right? I think it's very interesting for me now that I sit in, in UNICEF and I work with health, nutrition, education, on poverty reduction, WASH, climate, right? So we have a, a much larger portfolio than I had when I was at the bank. 
And and one thing that is uh, very interesting to see, right, is the progress and the results that we have been able to achieve and deliver in issues like under five mortality, nutrition, right? Uh, and a lot of them came from, sure, the interventions are different, right? The vaccines are somewhat simpler, but you talk to the colleagues in health about how you organize a cold chain for delivering of vaccines, it's it's non-trivial as well, right? But a lot of this came out of the community health workers, right? Which was changing the way we deliver health to, to adjust for the reality in the context of the countries. And sometimes I still have the feeling that the, the educational model that we have and we are promoting all over is the same one as France in the 19th century. And which is a teacher, a school, a classroom, right? Um, and but we are not in France in the 19th century, right? And, and I think the the French 19th century, right, uh, model worked up to a certain extent, right? I think Latin America was able to use that. East Asia was able to use that. You look at the results of Latin America and East Asia in in terms of learning. They're not. They have not caught up with the high income countries, right? They've tried to mimic that model and they're still half away from where right, learning poverty in Latin America is 50%. In Europe is 5%, right? So Latin America has not caught up, right? East Asia has not caught up. I mean, yeah. they're better, right? So I think it is important to look for for African solutions for Africa and, yeah. and be open-minded. But again, putting the teachers at the center of, of this process. Yeah, thank Over you so you. much for that, Dr. Pedro. I mean, there is no doubt here, the chief statistician, right? <laughs> All right, and then having teachers at the center is also, I mean, it correlates with what Siku had mentioned earlier about teachers being at the center of all ed tech initiatives. And I think it is something profound that um, Africans really need to take into consideration. Yeah, we have Dr. Rislan on the call. Um, Dr. Rislan, um, and nice to have you here. Sorry about the, the journey and challenges you faced in earlier. So Dr. Rislan is actually the Deputy Vice Chancellor, IT Research and Innovation at Bees University. He has a PhD in ICT for Development Computing at the University of Portsmouth and an MBA from the University of Wales. So there is no doubt that we really have the right person. I mean, I think I should mention that he has had um, a quite number of experience in coaching and mentoring over 2,000 young persons, right, on the power of computers, the internet, and social media. Hi, Dr. Rislan, um, it's nice to have you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to participate. And I must acknowledge uh, the work PG and colleagues are doing at the Center for the Study of the Economy of Africa. The report is a uh, really, really interesting report. I had a look at the report, and uh, it clearly showed to us that uh, there is a lot of work that needs to be done around EdTech in Nigeria and, and also beyond. I'm trying to contextualize my talk, you know, but I still believe uh, EdTech hold the promise for building sustainable, inclusive and resilient learning ecosystem for Africa, uh, where as clearly showed to us that learning poverty is very high. So, over the last 10 years, I've been involved in many projects in Nigeria, particularly digital education, uh, as well as uh, digital assessment and evaluation. The major area of concern is the learning poverty gap. Uh, in the absence of foundational learning poverty, uh, getting the best from EduTech may be really, really very difficult. And I'm making reference with a state where I came from, where learning poverty is as high as 99%. And uh, uh, I mean, I have to say this, I, sometimes I became very emotional uh, when I say this all, all the time. So and if you look at the teacher uh, capacity and capability is a big issue. Uh, we don't have enough teachers. And uh, I wanted to share something, but when I look at the timing, I decided to share this. Where you have teachers with a ratio very high, access to technology, still very difficult. And looking at my own experience when I, uh, uh, led the Nigeria Landon Passport Project is a UNICEF uh, funded project through GPE and domesticated at the Federal Ministry of Education. I was at the forefront and clearly there's this report and what my colleagues said, Chiku and Pedro, 
the policy instrument is very uh, available uh, in Nigeria and other African countries. In fact, I have to say this in Nigeria, beyond just the ICT policy uh, in the country, we have ICT policy for education. We have also digital learning policy. So there is no vacuum in the entire policy system. And in terms of access to devices, I mean, I have to confess that uh, from the data and from the reality, uh, because I'm a field worker, visit field, I visit school, I've seen what teachers are doing, there is access to technology to some extent. And I have to say this also, there is a lot of uh, deliberate intervention by various agencies in Nigeria. I, I can give an example, UNICEF, uh, during the London Passport Project, uh, good number of tablets given out, I think about uh, 30,000 tablets, if I can remember. Uh, and uh, some selective school were targeted with digital teacher training. A lot has been done around that to, uh, to speed up the digital pedagogy, uh, as well as uh, data. You know, UNICEF generously uh, 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 take part in the digital learning uh, 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 project in Nigeria where they're giving free data. So if you have Airtel SIM card, you can easily access the digital learning platform without having to pay any data. Uh, a lot of work has been done around that with the connectivity. And if you look at uh, content in Nigeria, I mean, I still say this, we have done a lot. Uh, we developed over 16,000 content, digital content from video to audio, and not just national content, but content developed based on the region. You know, Pedro mentioned this uh, in Africa, we have language barrier, ethnicity, and even slang around how we talk. So a, a lot of work has been done. In Nigeria, we contextualize the content uh, based on region, and they, we, they are localized. I mean, I don't like thinking about it, but we have to localize it, and I've been inspired by, by, by Pedro. And a lot of incentive has been given uh, by many states. I, I think I wanted to share this, Maybe let me see if I can. We have a ranking where we rank many states in Nigeria uh, based on their access to learning passport. So what I'm saying this is teacher been trained, uh, devices been given out, uh, content been developed, curated, localized. We know most of the digital learning content are very boring because they are not content specific, but now we have content that is very specific uh, to our region. Teachers been trained, but unfortunately, the access to this digital technology is still very low. I'm very worried. I'm no longer part of the project, but I'm still part of the WhatsApp group where we have all the champions across Nigeria. And data coming out is not encouraging. I give an example. Some states were given up to 1,500 tablets uh, with free access to the internet uh, and, and router and sometimes even power bank to, to bridge the power uh, connectivity issue that we have in Africa. But still, we don't have up to 1,000 users. Mm. So. That clearly shows to us, if you have 1,000 tablets, you should be able to have at least one user connecting to the device in a month. So it's a big issue that I think we need to go deep. And that's an area where I think your report going forward need to uh, deepen, uh, get real quantitative data. I believe UNICEF and the Federal Ministry of Education is interested in, in doing this. So that's an area where I think we need to uh, focus. We know infrastructure is a big issue uh, in Africa, uh, but people still use WhatsApp. You know, uh, and I mean, I, a colleague of mine from my university, we did a research uh, to look at the exposure of teacher in the high to reach area with digital connectivity and devices. We discovered that over 72% have access to smartphone and they all have WhatsApp. So, and why is it stopping us from doing digital learning? I think we need to look at this beyond that. Probably we may need to make digital learning to be more social, maybe uh, make it more easy, maybe more, uh, the value should be very visible. And I like what, uh, uh, Chiku said, maybe put some incentives uh, around promotion. And we have done that in my university. I, mean, we, I remember before COVID-19 in my university, uh, we made it very clear, every user must use digital learning platform. It's a compulsory thing. And that's why when COVID-19 came in my university where I work, we didn't lose a single day. As federal government said, close the door, go back to home. We move online. We didn't lose a single day. And that the time we had a breakthrough. So I can say from evidence, from experience, EduTech have a big uh, potential, but getting that potential requires a very consistent and sustainable uh, investment. And beyond that, the stakeholder need to be well sensitized, uh, and probably we need to do it differently, because that's an area where also my university is uh, studying, and uh, we have a lot of evidence from that. We still want to do EduTech the same way we do the normal, the normal uh, education. 
So uh, the pedagogy needs to be uh, rejig, modernized. In fact, in my university, we do three hours lectures. And when we move online, we still put three hours lectures. And before one hour, already everyone is out of that. And that's the lesson we learned. We were doing our learning passport project in Nigeria. We made the content to be very, very short, not more than three, four minutes, and make it very, very more engaging and make it more localized and more contextualized. But beyond that, uh, from the policy side, I think that is still need more for more investment. Uh, if you look at the data you presented, uh, most of the schools are not connected. And I'm giving experience. I recently led a research in one of the northern states in Nigeria, Jigawa in particular, where access to computer in our school is just about uh, 11%. Access to power is just about uh, 22%. And school with access to power more than four hours is just about 5%. So a lot of gap. But as we are looking at this infrastructural gap, which are the foundational, we still need to look at the possibility of changing mindset. The teacher mindset needs to be really, really completely overhauled. And now that we have AI, we have chat GPT, we have uh, other gen AI, how do we bring them to the classroom? Uh, I said this exactly about two weeks ago at ICT for D conference in, in Accra. And when we had a panel to look at, to look at the tech for good, I said, yeah, I have no fear about AI, but can we use AI too? to easily address this gap, uh, which I believe they are fundamental. And I haven't seen any serious investment and commitment. If you look at the report push, uh, put by the UNICEF, they put a big budget for us to get every child uh, connected, uh, powered with power and uh, provided with digital learning. We don't have that investment. And I don't see it coming from our region. How do we use this emerging technology to accelerate this our effort? I think that's an area where I think we need to, uh, to focus, leverage this emerging technology and accelerate our effort. At the same time, put incentives. At the same time, uh, put uh, major, you know, M and E, uh, as well as accountability. I think that's an area where we need to do more. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Rislan. I mean, that was really, really exhaustive. And I mean, it's really a pity the, um, the, low, the low level of adoption we've had um, in Africa generally. I mean, sharing, giving your experience with the learning passports, and it, it, it's something we, we should really consider. All right. So um, we're well, moving over to you, Siko, back to you, Siko. And um, in, I mean, Siko, it would be nice to get your point of view when it, um, as it relates to equity and inclusion. You know, what do you really have to say about how edtech initiatives can be designed, you know, to ensure that they're able to reach marginalized or undesired population, you know, children with disabilities and those living with um, living in remote areas? Because this is really something we saw. Even I remember having a, a conversation with um, one of the leaders uh, of Edobest in Nigeria, and that was really something he complained about in terms of the fact that these initiatives do not, do not really reach remote areas and marginalized persons. So what do you have to say about um, that? I think I'll start with a phrase that has stayed with me since the GEM report on education technology was released sometime last year. Technology for who and on whose terms? So if we're talking about using technology to bridge the gap and we want to look at our areas that we call marginalized, what does marginalized mean? So again, back to the role of, of evidence, we need to go into these areas and understand using evidence, what is it? What, what is it that we're trying to address? Because there's no point in deploying technology for technology's sake. You need to understand why have these areas been considered marginalized for a long time? What are, and how can technology, so in fact, we did a study on this um, with the EdTech Hub that we presented at CIS earlier this year. And we wanted to highlight the potential of technology, but we wanted to come at it at a different angle. Let's not just talk about deploying technology. Let's look at the areas and see what are the barriers to enrollment? What are the barriers to retention? And what are the barriers to participation? And how can technology help us to address this? A simple example there would be, how do we get our teachers equipped to be able to use technology to just track enrollment and be able to use that data to tell us, okay, when I look at enrollment and I look at, at, at performance at the end of the term, I'm able to tell it's because this child did not attend. So that way you're also introducing technology to, a, to the teacher in a meaningful way. They're able to use it to assist them because currently this paper on pen, it's very difficult to be able to collate that data and it makes sense. So how do we use technology to understand why there are always gaps in participation and enrollment and especially retention, even where governments are spending a lot of time trying to increase enrollment. 
I think another area that, and I think you mentioned it great, is learners with disability in these areas. How can technology play a role? What is the assistive technology that we can begin to deploy to ensure that these children, even if you were to set up the basic structures around edtech in their schools and in their communities, that this learners and these children are not being left behind. Again, girls, when you look at, I'm just talking about the areas, when you when you think about marginalized areas, these are the key areas that, you know, we, we begin to dig into. What are the barriers to girls' participation? We did a study a while back that revealed that even at the household level, the child is being, do I say deprived? Deprived seems a little um, extreme, but if you look at a, at a girl in, in an African setting, when we get home from school, and this is something that I have experienced myself, as soon as you put me and my brother, as soon as you put your bags down, I already have a role to do. My brother can dilly-dally, if there's technology in the house, he can begin to use it almost immediately. I have roles that are ascribed to me because I'm a woman. How do we begin to make sure that we're deliberately addressing some of these nuances and biases using technology that keep our girls behind? And by the way, this same study showed that if you expose girls to technology, they, they adopt faster than boys. So, you know, we're keeping them away from a tool that could actually be an accelerator for them. And then also, how do we provide curriculum out of from technology? Because we have a lot of out of school learners. And the reality is, just as someone had mentioned, our teacher ratios are not likely to improve. Our out of school children numbers are in some areas. I think there was a study that was done around foundational learning that was released earlier this year. That children out of school learners in Kenya, the, it has increased by about 1%. How do we begin to reach these children where they where they are? We don't even have enough schools. Um, I think it, 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 it was mentioned that the, our, our numbers in our, our children numbers keep growing faster than we are able to put together brick and mortar. So how do you begin to use technology even to reach out those out of school learners? And then also, how do we ensure, most importantly, that the technology we're exposing our children to is safe, it's accessible, that it has digital content that's actually, you know, working for them? I think um, maybe I want to close by going back to policy and policy that is driven very much by evidence. If you begin to gather and generate evidence, that begins to inform how you deploy policy. You can't deploy the same, and I think I mentioned this before, you can't deploy the same um, policy for say Nairobi that you would for Garissa in our frontier counties. There are some nuances there around culture, around religion that you're going to miss that deliberately either keep children out of learning or create a different pathway for these children. It doesn't matter what you say at a policy level. There's a way that culture guides how we implement. So how do we make sure that we are understanding that from the get-go and that we are creating policies that are including everybody? I think I'll leave it there. Wow, thank you very much, Siku. Yeah, over to you, um, Dr. Pedro. Um, I remember that um, I had mentioned that you worked um, at as, as an EdTech fellow at the World Bank. And I'm sure you must have led very impressive um, projects at the World Bank. It would be really nice to you know, get you to share some of your challenges and success stories during your stay at the World Bank, you know, and how you could really connect it to the current challenges that um, is ravaging Africa. Sure, thank you. And, and once again, I think congratulations for the report. I think it's a, it's a critical piece of analytical work and, and much needed. Uh, I do feel that, uh, and I, I'm, you know, my first intervention was very much, I think, on, on the spirit of the motivation. And I, and I do feel that when we talked about attack, it is important to motivate it properly. And as Siku mentioned, have a clear diagnostic of what is the problem that we are trying to tackle. And I feel that this is, is something that is a little bit missed, right? Because when you look at the what some interventions come, right, for some of them are actually trying to improve access, right? Some of them are trying to improve learning. Not all of them are trying to do everything, right? So, so, so people are coming from very different places and very different motivations when they are talking about attack. I think that, um, unfortunately, the with the COVID, was a massive global, you know, experiment and shock. In in and I think edtech is uh is an area in which it was rapidly deployed, right under the worst possible conditions, and we've seen this happening, right? Given that the planning for it was very little, right, and and infrastructure was very unevenly distributed, right. 
but it's it's interesting to see that and i feel that the if you look at you know the narrative that we had during the crisis during the pandemic it was very back very much kind of building back better right and there was a lot of hopes that a lot of that infrastructure was going to be continue to be used continue to be deployed and and when i look back many of those that tech most of those that tech interventions actually have vanished i mean in in high income countries right in particular they are pretty much gone right uh the world is back to to the educational system that we had before the pandemic right we need to ask ourselves why right even in high income countries right the what what edtech has left after the pandemic right wasn't that that kind of flourishing of 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 ideas and things that have proven to work right uh, now does that mean that means that we need to double down on this right we need to actually uh look at it harder and and look at it better right but but not think that you know because of the pandemic and the rollout that we had uh during those uh year and a half right that uh we now have learn a lot and we have lots of different examples of what is really working very effectively right uh, now what i see uh in terms of the the places in which i have been able to improve learning right uh one element that is critical is is reading material right kids need to have access to to reading material right uh, it doesn't need to be sophisticated need but it has to be age appropriate right so i think that there are some basic and some of this i think when we talk about ed tech as well i think we need to also recognize the the low tech or the traditional tech and the and the high tech uh, technology right and how we combine the two things i think in in africa one of the challenges that i've noticed is is precisely because of the multiplicity of languages Right. How do we generate sufficient reading material at scale for kids that are age appropriate? I'm very hopeful and 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 have uh, an optimistic, as as Greg mentioned, about generative AI. I think generative AI has a huge potential to help us create reading reading content at scale in different languages. Right. Uh, but that part of the the technology can help on that, for example. Right, it can help us create examples of of reading content uh, that is uh, age appropriate and and grade appropriate uh, in the right languages. Right, because we need the local languages, especially from 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 the early grade experience. I think there's a lot of evidence that shows that. I mean, this is what is really happening on the ground, right? And technology can be critical for that. Um, but we also have to recognize that probably those kids need printed material to read right it's not enough to give them a tablet right there's a lot that kids learn i'm an economist by training but my mother is a teacher my sister is a teacher i learn from them and i and i have twin daughters right but and there's a lot that kids learn using their hands at, at that age right and that's part of the experience of actually touching and, and flipping the pages and 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 looking for their content in a, their interactive way in a printed material right and 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 we need to figure out how to also so it, one part of the problem is what you're going to be printing and I think technology can help on that, but we also have to figure out how to be able to print at scale, in a very cost effective way and deliver at the right places right because the right reading material, a year later two years later three years later is no longer the right reading material right. So there's a logistical element that needs to be recognized. And we need to oh. find the best possible prices for this. Yeah. And again, I think technology can help, right, in, in terms of finding who are the suppliers to this value chain. Where can we, and how, do, how do we organize the logistics, which is not just the technology in the classroom, but is the technology throughout the whole supply chain. Hmm. Thank you very much, Dr. Pedro. Very, 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 very important. And also learn from you know, your personal experience as well as uh, the father of the team. All right. So the final final question for the panel would be um, for Dr. Rieslan. 
Um, I mean, Dr. Rusland, um, you had very, shared with us very invaluable insight, I mean, given your experience with the learning passports. But um, now, I think it would be really nice to get you to share, I mean, given your experience um, in ICT for development and uh, you know, higher education planning, um, how do you really see um, EdTalk evolving in addressing the learning crisis in Africa in the following years, especially given you know, the different socioeconomic backgrounds that um, you find in Africa? How do you, is how is EdTech, how do you see EdTech really evolving in the future um, for Africa? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the, the final question. I think uh, I, I like uh, the work Pedro is doing at UNICEF. And if you look at the reality uh, and looking at what World Bank is doing around ICT for D, I've been in this uh, game for almost uh, 15 years. Uh, in 2012, World Develop, I mean World Bank in their World Development Report clearly said to us, over 70% of ICT intervention in developing country failed to deliver value. And that have to do with using ICT to deliver vaccine, to deliver learning, uh, support uh, remote worker and the rest. And I recently had a look at the World Development Report again, and uh, World Bank clearly said to us that yes, people are connected, everyone now have access to internet, but the impact is still at a very threshold level. And I think I shared just a screen. And I like that screen. It clearly shows to us that ICT can do wonder only if we have a, a solid infrastructure. The potential of EdTech will be very, very much uh, bigger if we begin to do things uh, in a more systemic way. So final word, uh, for the government, I think there is a lot of work to do around the policy. Maybe we need to retweak the policy, uh, make the policy very, very uh, visible with a very well set measurable KPI. I think it's very important to say, yes, if we put this in EduTech, we should be able to reduce learning poverty. We should be able to reduce uh, education deprivation as well as uh, school deprivation. And that will clearly put every stakeholder uh, in, in play. And also we may need to do things around quality assurance, make digital learning more uh, robust and work around the measurement and the evaluation, make it uh, very, very standard. I think that's the worry most of my colleagues are. Yes, if you put everything online, you put examination online, how sure are you? Children may not cheat because in the physical classroom, they also cheat. So that's an area where I think we need to do more uh, to build trust in the ecosystem, enhance the system with biometrics and also identity. I think that's an issue where I have to say more. In Africa, most of our youngsters and children have no identity. If users have no identity, how do you know they are the real learners? I think we need, government need to do more around that. And I think in Nigeria, we're doing a lot with ID for development. And I've seen that even in the project where I'm doing, uh, we don't allow anyone to go in if you don't have identity. And also credit worthiness. I think we also need to do things around that. If someone learn online, we don't need to put digital learning or edited content or resources as a supplementary. We have to make it to match with the same standard or quality or evaluation with that of the usual uh, or brick and mortar. I think that's for the government. Then for the user, I think we need to do more awareness uh, to engage the learners. Majority of our learners are not really, really uh, very much aware. I think we need to do more around that. And I've seen that uh, very often with the UNICEF and the Ministry of Education, a lot of campaign in the radio, in television, banners, business school to school. And from the evidence uh, from what we have uh, from the actual digital learning in Nigeria, Instead, that have high number of readers are basically because of the intensive engagement and campaign. And I think we need to do more around inclusion. Uh, from the preliminary evidence, women are not really been taken care of. It is very visible. And people in the hard to reach area, uh, they are not been taken care of. And people that are poor, uh, they are not really, we don't have any serious plan to support them. And going forward, for all the practitioners, uh, and the and the and, and the tech uh, guys we need to do more around improving the human computer interaction element the digital learner must be very very engaging we know the distraction we all experience if you are doing things online uh, because we too like this are uh, mobile i think we need to do more around that by investing heavily in learn analytics uh, to collect huge amount of data about the learners and maybe use that to calibrate for the intervention around uh, device design, around content design, around platform, as well as uh, pedagogy. And for the think tank like uh, your organization, I, I think, and also civil society and non-governmental organization, a lot of work needs to be done, including the religious institution. They all have to be part of this system 
so that no one left behind. And uh, believe me, if we go through that pathway, a lot uh, of possibility and opportunity uh, is waiting for us ahead. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Rislan, for that. Really, really um, insightful. Um, all right. So I think I should mention to all our participants, once again, thank you so much for joining us. And at this point, we'd love to have your questions. If you have any question for Dr. DG, the presenter, or any of our panelists, please do well to use the Q&A section. But um, while we're on that, Dr. DG, there's a question for you here. Um, this is from James Blowett. And James is asking, I think in response to your presentation on the low government interest in education technology in Africa, James is asking how much of government's lack of interest can be ascribed to edtech suppliers not investing sufficient effort in research? And that's for you, Dr. Deji. Oh, that, that's, that's quite interesting. Um, I mean, one, I mean, one of the key thing that um, as, um, um, I mean, CC Center for Study of Economics of Africa uh, as a think tank um, organization has always advocated for is um, evidence-based policy making. So um, we, we we want to see, um, I mean, ec tech, we can, we can say many good things about it, but we want to evidence to actually drive whatever inclusion that will take place in the classrooms. And I must say that uh, that has not been um, a major thing that we've seen. I think maybe, uh, and, and I ascribe in one end to, I mean, what, what the uh, person is actually suggesting, because, I mean, when you look at technology, I mean, technology, I mean, there's this matter around, um, you do it and you fail. I mean, so what, what technology really means is you don't really test in terms of whether it will work or not. It's about you just trying it, if it works, it's fine. So I think that technology mindset in education, it's a problem uh, because it's it's not it, it's it's not just if it doesn't work. I mean, uh, look at in Peru, uh, look at in Kenya, government invested so much on one laptop per child, uh, uh, it, it was a huge investment that government, I mean, that we can't just really say it's it's wasted, it's wasted. I mean, that cannot be the case. We need actually to be guided by evidence. So I believe uh, um, more evidence will change governments, right? More evidence will see people. But I think the, the, the problem we are seeing and which we, um, we think we could actually drive further in, in our subsequent work it's to really say which evidence do we really live on it. It's not about is it table, is it about content alone. It's about what works, why it works, and um, so that we can actually understand very well. For example, sometimes it's WhatsApp. I think some uh, a presenter have talked about that. If it is WhatsApp that will work, we can use it. If it is SMA, I mean, one of the success story of technology in Africa is Mpesa, and it's a simple kind of feature phone intervention that has really, really brought a lot of financial inclusion on the continent. I think it's just we understanding what works. Um, it, there is this kind of um, leap to say, okay, AI, um, this big technology, but we need to really say what works for our own environment. And I think that should be, the, to me, the foundation, evidence. And to me, um, everybody is actually lacking. The air tech and many communities need to come together to really create uh, that community. It's not, it's not just about our city to say, okay, there's an impact, but let's actually dig deeper into terms of what really works for this group. Why does it work for them? So that we can actually elicit and um, get the picture right. And when we invest, it should be cost uh, value for money rather than really risking very scarce government and public investments. Wow. Thank you very much, Dr. Deji. Um, I think just right before um, you go, um, I would love I would love to ask this last question from Ibrahim Ayuba. And he says, mm -hmm. very excellent presentation, Dr. Deji. How can we use this very important policy research evidence for advocacy? I think that's a very important question for you. Yeah, I think the, the, the advocacy part is actually maybe what I would say we've started this morning, as we have heard from the panelists and from um, also from the engagement from the audience. Um, what I can say is it's already kind of, we are starting the conversations. What should we be the next steps? This report is just more kind of a bad eye view of the state of things. 
And if we really want to make the solution, it's not going to be an African-wide report that would actually mm -hmm. shift the, really the narrative. It could be, I think, like Dr. Rislan's talk about what is happening in Jigawa. I mean, when it talks about in Jigawa has 99% learning poverty, that's a problem, right? That we need to really talk about. So, um, it's, it, I mean, the, the solution, I mean, EdTech has a solution, but we need to actually dig deep into what is even the problem in that area. So those are the kind of advocacy we need to be talking about. And I believe in terms of the solution, it's just not just going to be from the government alone. Um, I think every actor uh, can play a role, uh, research, um, advocacy, but more importantly is actually we identifying the problems and really going for it, right? Without we actually identifying problems, we are actually going to spend resources and that's actually risky because if we missed it, a lot of people would actually just talk about me. If I mean, if we if, if we if we lose it out, if we lose out on technology, the world might left us behind because this is actually going to change in a lot of things. So we need to make it work, and it's we actually getting the right team uh, doing the right thing that can make sure that um, we get the benefits of um, uh, technology in in Africa. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. DJ. Thank you so much for that. Um, so um, to um, Dr. Pedro, Dr. Rislan, and Siku, I've got a couple of questions here for you. Um, this is from Emmanuel Hugo. He, he says, it seems that discussions on the revolutionary impact of artificial intelligence often focus more on the implications for employment. But I would like to know your thoughts on how much, if at all, the rise of AI can disrupt learning in sub-Saharan Africa and whether we can expect automation to become a key component of education technology in the region. Um, I think Dr. Pedro mentioned something on AI during his conversation. Dr. Pedro, would you mind to take this? Sure. So I think, I mean, AI is a catch-all, right? And, and there's a lot of different elements of that. I'm, my comment was more specific on the generative AI, which is the kind of chat GPT type of uh, revolution that we now are in the midst. It's a tsunami. It's coming. Um, and I do think that there are many different types of applications. But the challenge, of course, is that it needs training data, right? It needs. So if we think for me, one of the first things that came to my mind when I started looking at these things was, as I mentioned, using to help translate lesson plans, right? A localized lesson plans into local, right? Have lesson, lesson plans in, in local language, having reading uh, material that is age appropriate for kids, right? Uh, doing that at scale rapidly, right? Uh, that's, that's one way in which we could be using generative AI. But in order for this to work, we need training data. We need some content in the local languages to be in the in in the system right technology will not generate things out of nothing yet right it is creative but with bounds thank god right uh, and i hope it stay like that for for a very long time right um we are still needed humans right so we need to make sure that the there is some some you know, reading material in different lingo, local languages that these models can build from and can train from, right? If we don't have that to begin, you know, it's not going to be able to create reading materials in a local language that has never have anything digital format on the web, right? Or whatever was there was in, of poor quality, right? It's going to do a poor job, right? Uh, so yes, I'm optimistic, right? Uh, I think uh, I think it can be used but it will require intentionality. It will require, uh, you know, deliberate actions, right? And and I think as, as Dr. Uh, I, I didn't mention, right? I think understanding what is the problem that we are trying to solve, right? I think that I am, I must say, not a, a, a great believer of a thousand flower blooming, right? I think, uh, you know, you can have a beautiful garden, but, no trees will grow from that, right? You're going to have a lot of little flowers, but actually what we are talking about here is building a forest, right? Not, not a garden, right? We need yeah, strong yeah. trees uh, with deep roots. <laughs> so um, flowers are perennial, right? You come a winter, they are gone, right? We need evergreens. We need flowers that, you know. <laughs> um, so I think we... 
but yes, but I do think that it is possible to use some of that. All right, all right. Thank you very much for that. Um, I believe Imano has received a response to his question. So we have just two more questions to go. Um, we're almost out of time. Um, um, Jimmy, this is this is from Jimmy, and I would love you to take this sequel if you don't mind. Jimmy says, "I feel the report should have been explored." Uh, should have explored internet connectivity bandwidth differences as it relates to adoption across contexts and across technology. With AI requiring more bandwidth could be a barrier in low income areas. I wonder what the panelists think. I mean, I think um, Dr. Dr. Pedro already shared some insights on this, but um, what do you have to say? Maybe in one minute, Siko, what do you have to say about the internet connectivity? In I agree um, that connectivity is going to continue to be an issue. But I would not, I would love for, and if, if, when I think about Kenya, we've been talking about last mile connectivity and we've made great progress. But you can have the connectivity, but the sustainability is a whole other issue. If if we don't have government funding um, or budget allocation to be able for these schools to be able to pay for their internet connection every day, um, or rather every month, then connectivity really doesn't mean much. But there are other options. There are lots of online options and maybe Rather than focus on what we don't have, we should begin to focus on how do we get how do we get this content offline for our learners. But is it an issue? Yes, definitely. I wanted to add something to what uh, Pedro said around AI, and it's something I've been thinking about a lot. We need to get our content there wherever there is, so that AI can pick it up. And I feel like our best bet is our teachers. This shows me how critically we need to focus on, on upscaling our teachers. We need our teachers to begin to innovate using technology so that they are the ones that are creating the content that can then be picked up. Because as you said, even now, if we were to generate, we're generating from data that doesn't talk to us, it doesn't talk about us, it doesn't have our value systems. So who, who, do, who, who has the quickest access to be able to help us to generate? It's our teachers. I feel like I've advocated for teachers enough in this conversation. <laughs> I, I think I think I think we did we need to realize just how pivotal they are. And I think part of helping change that mindset is to show them that technology will always be a tool. It will not be able to replace mm. teachers. Learners will not be able to learn because of technology. They learn because of the teachers. I remember my teachers from primary school. I struggle to remember softwares. And so how do we also make sure that we are we are integrate? It's not it's not enough to put them in a room and train them. So begin to give them some of these tools to create themselves so that then they pick it up for themselves. We will see that translated in our learners within no time. Let me stop there. All right. Thank you very much, Siku. <laughs> that was very, um, not just insightful, but hilarious one as well. All right. So um, unfortunately, we would have to take only one more question because we are already out of time. And I would love Dr. Rislan to take this. So an anonymous attendee is asking, as an entrepreneur who is interested in education, education technology, what problems can I solve considering the state of ed tech in Nigeria? I mean, I think this would be more like trying to and um, streamline his interest and streamline them um, his intentions as an entrepreneur. Yeah, thank you very much. I think issues around offline uh, solution could be a big advantage uh, because I remember in 2021, uh, together with the Ministry of Education, we were able to host the EduTech conference. And, and since then we have been hosting annual and I'm privileged to say that I have access to almost 40 to 50 edutech uh, entrepreneurs in Nigeria, and they're not getting it really, really very easy. You know, I remember when we got the UNICEF project, I reached out to many edutech entrepreneurs and said, see, we don't have time to generate content because we are in emergency now. We just need content as easy as possible. Can you give us your content? We pay you. Majority of them said, no, if we give you our content, what are we going to do? I say, yes, but you give this content, if you do your market analysis, you may not get the money that you may necessarily generate from the sales of your content. If I were you, I would give this content and I would be innovative. Majority said, no, we don't want to do that. And I tell you, most of the editor uh, entrepreneurs post COVID, they are still getting it very hard. And uh, I think many of them have closed down. So key area, I think tech entrepreneurs need to focus on devices. If they can come up with the devices that are Local, as uh, Chiku said, uh, and learner can have access to this digital learning content without going through uh, data, which is very expensive, and devices that can support power connectivity. Believe me, many people will buy. 
because it's much, much easier. And I've seen many schools in my area in Abuja and few other cities in Nigeria moving away from the textbook. But textbooks, workbook, work manual, they're very, very expensive. Many schools have already put up physical books out of their school. So if tech entrepreneurs can focus around that, a lot of possible, and also leverage the national ecosystem. I mean, in Nigeria, a lot is ongoing. Even yesterday, at this morning, I had a call with the director of ICT, Federal Ministry of Education, is someone that have an open mindset. And he listened to tech, uh, edutech entrepreneurs very open. So align your agenda with the national uh, I mean, uh, program and probably work around remodeling your solution. And believe me, Nigerians are very, very much ready to buy. We have issues around learning passport, I mean, uh, you listen. And, Developing partners are also working very hard. Uh, parents of Nigerian UNICEF, uh, I just I was just told yesterday they develop offline uh, devices and offline routers that learners can access learning possible without going through the internet. So I think we have to really rally our entrepreneurs around that, and probably on a mission like uh, US CCSEA need to run an edtech summit. Maybe you can take it up as one of the major. Uh, project, run it annually, build capacity for editor entrepreneurs. And I've seen that big gap. Most of the editor entrepreneurs, as they just said, they're talking about technology, not solution. They're talking about generating content, but not engaging content that learners will love. So I think a lot of work needs to be done in the entire ecosystem. And uh, going forward, uh, we may see possibilities so that we don't get taken on our in the event if, if COVID comes. Currently in my office, I have a uh, uh, an active bias chancellor. I remember four years ago, he put a call to me, this land we are in COVID, how do we do that? And it's not that his university have no access to digital technology, but that is very, very fundamental issues. So if editor entrepreneurs can solve this basic fundamental issue we talked earlier, uh, I can see them smiling in the future. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Dr. DG, Dr. Pedro, Dr. Siku as well, <laughs> Dr. Rislin. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, so a very big thank you to all our panelists and to all participants for being in the session up to now. Before I pass um, the mic over to um, um, Trisilla David, the head of communications at CC to give the closing remarks, I need to mention that um, tomorrow CC is going to be having an IG live still on EdTech and it would be nice if you jump in on Instagram to also um, continue um, the conversation as well. And Daniela had shared some useful links and I am sharing that right away, just um, for those of us that joined maybe um, after Daniela had shared the opening remarks. So um, it's over to you, Jessela. Yeah, thank you very much, great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to make a brief closing remarks and um, basically just express our gratitude to everyone who made this um, webinar possible. So, um, our distinguished guests and participants, I would like to thank you on behalf of um, the Center for the Study of the Economies of Africa, CC, as well as the Southern Voice and um, Group for the Analysis of Development, that's Grady. Thank you everyone for taking um, time to attend this webinar. Um, I would also like to extend our gratitude to our speakers for their um, excellent and very thought-provoking insights that they shared um, during this um, session to Dr. Rislan, to Chiku and Dr. Pedro. Thank you so much for your contributions. I also want to thank everyone um, of the participants. You know, we've had a very active um, chat box, all your questions, your comments. And we hope we've been able to respond to as many as um, possible. And uh, today we've been able to highlight and discuss a range of issues around the state of ed tech in Africa and the challenges that come with it and how an effective implementation of um, education techn uh, technology strategies can help address learning crisis in this region. Um, one of the key takeaways today, which um, resonated during our panel session is the need to prioritize building the capacities of teachers in this process and to better equip them to use the technology so they can also impact learning. Um, we had some very useful recommendations on some of the practices that African countries can adopt. And um, I think that overall it has been a very interesting session. 
And we believe that this is a step in the right direction that would help us um, advance um, educational technology in Africa. And just like Greg said, we shared the link to the full reports there. We hope that we can keep the conversation going. If you have any questions, comments, you can always reach out to us. Um, um, uh, you can visit our website, our email, our contacts are there, and we'll be happy to always provide feedback. Thank you all so much. And um, I would like to officially um, bring this meeting to a close. Um, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye.